Ryan joins us now from his home in New York. Ryan, thank you so much for joining me. I cannot imagine being a 19 year old young man convicted of murder, a crime you had nothing to do with. When you heard 40 years in prison, um, is it is it like a sonic boom where almost you don't hear the words or you're in shock? I look at that picture of you. So some part of that reality you were absorbing in that moment. Certainly, certainly. It's earth shattering. Um, you know, you're with your family there. They're behind you. And you not only feel the weight of your life being taken from you, but theirs as well. And it's just such a struggle for everyone in that moment. And, and you try to compose yourself throughout that whole ordeal. But when they say that, and you know you're innocent, and you know that the police and prosecutors know you're innocent, they still did that to you. It, it just takes away all hope you have in the world and humanity. Oh my goodness, you know, you made national headlines, um, obviously because of the nature of the case, the victim in the case. And there were people who were convinced that you were a murderer. And, you know, how do you muster up, I guess, the, the fortitude to keep fighting to prove that you're innocent? I just know that uh, for my family and myself, I have to fight to get my life back. And we have the evidence to prove my innocence. It's a matter of getting out of that small community that we were in and showing the world that I was innocent. And what I saw as time went on was there were so many others like myself, a lot of wrongfully convicted in people, uh, wrongfully convicted people in prison. There you were, no physical evidence in your case, um, entirely convicted of testimony from two people. When you started to read the headlines like after the conviction, like everyone else, I know they have papers in prison, you're there and you're reading convicted murderer, and there's your name. And you know that so many people don't read the rest of the story or they don't read the, the police report. They just read your name and murderer in that headline. It's, it's such a painful thing to read because they always started out with convicted murder. And you know that you had nothing to do with this. And you know there's evidence to prove that, that police and prosecutors hid, they manipulated, they changed. And so you know that people aren't reading the rest of that story, but you also have hope that the facts will get out there and people will read those, um, those parts of the story. And ultimately, in my case, because we kept fighting for it, because I have such an amazing family and I ended up having a, a, an amazing attorney as well and Kathleen Zellner, we were able yeah. to get those facts out. And that was the difference between my case and a lot of people's cases is getting the facts and then getting them out to the public. Such a difficult thing to do. I do have to make the point that Charles Erickson, uh, the man involved in the case, has stated publicly that his guilty plea was coerced. I mean, it's dizzying, Ryan, the details and the back and forth and the bizarre nature of even the, the mention of suppressed memory that I'm sure to some degree you understand how people, how people just see a headline and don't go past that. Yeah, it's sad because that's kind of how a lot of people in in Missouri believed I was guilty because they read the headlines that the police gave to the local media. Later on, whenever the national media got a hold of it and actually did investigative reporting and looked at the real facts of the case and didn't just care what the police said, that's when people started to see what was really going on here. But in a lot of cases, people see the local media repeating whatever the police and prosecutors once said, and that's what's so scary, and that's how so many lives are lost. So I urge everyone to read more into the details and question a lot of the facts prosecutors are presenting to the local media. Coming up, Ryan may still be in prison if it wasn't for the dedication and sacrifice of his father, Bill. You heard him refer to his family. Well, how Bill fought to show the world that there was more to the story than the headlines they were reading. And Bill joins us when we come back. Ryan's dad, Bill, joins us from his home in Missouri. Bill, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Absolutely. Looking at what you did for your son, you know, people say I would walk a mile over hot coal and all of these things for our children. You drained your bank account, your life savings, your 401k, um, because you, as you described it, I believe it was, it was like watching your son drown in front of you. That's true. That's true. And uh, you'll do, you know, you never think you're going to be in that situation, but when it uh, does uh, occur, then at that moment, you naturally, naturally do everything you could do 
to save him or save any one of your children. You drove 9,000 miles crisscrossing the country with Ryan's face on your car to really blunt back the headlines that people were reading because you might miss a newspaper, but who's going to miss that car and wonder what's going on there? How did you come up with that idea? You know, uh, I just thought about a billboard, but billboards are stationary. So I thought of the idea of the car and then uh, drive it across the country, uh, east to west, and basically north to south, and like you said, 9,000 miles. And uh, we gained a tremendous amount of attention. 